Okay. Um, my name is Angela Dimitrakaki, and um, I want to welcome you all to um, today's um, lecture, um, which I will be chairing. So, to start with the basics, it's uh, Thursday, the 29th of April, 2021, and it is my great pleasure to be introducing curator and writer Ileana Fokianaki as a contributor to the Fine Art Lecture Series. Fine Art is an innovative uh, and international uh, training network examining the future of European independent art spaces in a period of socially engaged art. It is jointly led by the University of Wolverhampton, which is the coordinating force, uh, Zeppelin University that directs the training program, and also the University of Iceland and the University of Edinburgh, where I am based. Uh, prior to Iliana, we had John Roberts, who's also with us tonight, and then Greg Cholette as contributors to this lecture series. Uh, their long-term engagement with issues that are at the heart of uh, fine art generated discussion and ideas that will feed into the project in various ways and at various stages. Yet one aim of the public lecture series, which focuses on the role, impact, implications, and future of socially engaged art, is to provide an inclusive environment for thought and debates also beyond the research project um, as such. And thank you for joining us um, for this. Now, Ileana's work as the founder and director of the independent art space uh, State of Concept in Athens and also as a curator who works collaboratively uh, with institutions in an international uh, context has been inspiring to many, including myself, I should say. Iliana founded State of Concept uh, in 2013 as the first nonprofit institution um, in the city, in the capital city of Greece that promotes Greek and international artists through solo exhibitions mostly, but also invites international curators to create um, exhibitions that comment on the current socio-political landscape of Greece and beyond. Um, as put actually by a friend uh, recently to me, um, Iliana perhaps doesn't know this, uh, State of Concept has been in his words, the most political art space uh, in Athens. And how does one actually achieve this? One of Iliana's collaborative uh, projects uh, together with Antonia Lampi was Future Climates, a platform that um, aimed, aims to propose viable futures for small scale organizations of contemporary art and culture. Uh, first presented in Athens in March 2017 with a three month school. Iliana was also a curator um, at Extra City uh, Kunsthalle in Antwerp. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, and she's also a lecturer at the Dutch Art Institute. Having lectured and taken part in panel discussions in independent spaces and institutions worldwide, and also being recently um, our contemporary theory and curatorial uh, fellow at the University of Edinburgh, tonight Iliana will talk about curating as instituting peripheries and precarity. A lot of rich words in, um, in this title. Um, now, regarding um, housekeeping, I'm sure you've done this before, uh, those of you joining us. Uh, so you are encouraged to um, send your questions, to type your questions in the textbooks um, as Ileana is speaking. Um, and also to not unmute yourselves if you're muted. Um, because we will just let Iliana uh, present first and then we will have um, questions and comments and whatever else. And uh, your questions will be addressed in the order they reach us. And um, before I give you Iliana, I, I will also uh, mention that the May lecture is done um, on the 13th of, um, well, of May, obviously. Uh, by um, Kubas Rider from Poland, who is also a member of the network. And uh, then the June lecture is done by Maria Klavajowa from the Netherlands. And with this information, as we hope you will be joining us also in May and uh, June, 
I want to say a very warm uh, welcome to my friend Iliana. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and specifically, I mean, apart from thanking the whole Fine Arts team, I would like to also specifically thank uh, Rahel uh, and Karen for organizing this event. Um, I first of all, Angela, thank you very much for for this extended introduction and for the wonderful words. Um, I don't know if I deserve them really. Um, but also my other question is, uh, what is not political? You know, the most political space. I, I, a lot of people ask me this question and I always say, well, what is not political? E even being apolitical is, is a political position in the end. But um, to go to my lecture, I'm going to share my, my screen with you so that you... Oh, why do I not see my screen now? Um... Hmm. One moment. No, I don't see my screen. Hmm. Maybe because I was made a co host, now I can't see my screen. No. Uh, okay. One moment. technical issue. I will try again. There it is. So can you see it now? Perfect. So in order to be able to give you kind of more of a an overview or more of an accurate uh, description in relationship to my practice and the way it attempts to, let's say, reconsider the contemporary arts organization and specifically the institutions that we're looking at uh, at Fain Arts, those that are socially and politically engaged. Um, it's important, I think, to give an overview also on, on a couple of key elements or notions and words that inform the title of, of my talk today. Um, I'm going to start from the second part, periphery and precarity, um, maybe because they have been t terms that have been more contested, let's say, rather than curating and, or instituting. Um, the idea of periphery and the overuse of the term is uh, something I think that has been very much discussed specifically in relationship to contemporary art that was arriving from, uh, from the former Eastern Bloc. Or, or even South America in the case of the US, for example, from the 2000s onwards. And museums and collections have been trying to change their preconceptions on a linear and singular idea of uh, Western modernity and its contemporary manifestations as a universal truth for some time now. I'm not going to delve into an institutional critique in relationship to the Western Museum and how successfully or unsuccessfully it has been doing that. Uh, there are many exhibitions uh, of the last, let's say, six to seven years. One very random example we can say is Modernité Plurielle in uh, Pompidou in 2015, or the most uh, recent and quite contested exhibition, Theatre of Operations, um, the Gulf Wars 1991-2011 in MoMA PS1, which opened, I think, a few months before the pandemic, which are quite Where was I? Um, yeah, discussions about the global south, of course, that this what, uh, what constitutes the periphery was not analyzed enough. And I would say one of the few successful examples that have been addressing the questions that relate to geopoliticality, if we can call it, is uh, the long term research project of uh, fellow back Maria Hlavayeva, who is somewhere in one of these little boxes entitled Former West. But 
referring to the concept of center periphery or the core periphery model, uh, one must be aware, of course, of its origins uh, in economics. And this uh, binary of center periphery basically describes an unequal relationship between places. And it's used as a spatial, geographical, geopolitical description of a relation between a so-called advanced or dominating place and its allegedly lesser developed or serving periphery. And in this model, the cent I mean, of course, Brenton Woods is one example. The IMF as well has used these, these, these terms and actually cemented these terms. Uh, the periphery is a remote rural place and it delivers raw materials, food and other resources to the center under uh, the condition of exploitation. And the center, of course, provides goods and superior products, supposedly. And this relation is described as exploitative um, not only through Marxist, of course, traditional uh, modes of thinking, but I would say any logical <laughs> mode of thinking. But from a global point of view, this so-called underdeveloped or developing countries, where we would put as well Greece, for instance, have to be kept in dependency to wealthy states, the core or the center, as it's called. And this underdevelopment is not the result of tradition, but it is produced as part of a process necessary for the function of accelerated capitalism in the central capitalist countries. And of course, there is a desire and a political correctness in trying to abandon such terminology when they are discussed specifically in the field of culture, since they create new types of enclosures and eventually discrimination as well. But my position in relationship to this question is that because a lot of people think, oh my God, are we still talking about peripheries? It's, you know, it's, it's dated and what have you. But my position is that there is an embodiment of such uh, distinctions and discriminations in every facet of the way the neoliberal art world operates. So it's important to understand how and why still these mechanisms operate and why they can become actually a useful tool to unmask power imbalances. Imbalances that actually define the livelihood of hundreds of cultural workers in the so-called peripheries. But they also show something else that for me is also important and interesting, generalizations that create impressions for specific locations that prevail, mainly because of a lack of a, of a desire, let's say, to understand the complexities that every artistic scene has, its histories and its rhizomatic development, vis-a-vis -vis its more kind of generalized historization or putting it in, in a specific category. These impressions are not only part and parcel of the center towards the so-called other, but of one other against another other and so on. And they show that the neoliberal model of the art world where curators parachute to locations to curate exhibitions, have one month residencies to supposedly discover local scenes and so on, can only be a failed model since it hinders the capacity to research a place and its practices and see simply the basic key components and different aspects that define it. And to give a very crude example, specifically when we talk about these types of categorizations, I mean, Europe and the US and Australia at large are considered generally uh, the centers of production of canons of contemporary art uh, practice and, and history. And as regions, they have been setting the tone, supposedly, of how contemporary art theory and practice develop. However, um, as I pre-mentioned specifically for the region of the Balkans or Turkey or Greece, uh, they were very differently approached, each of them. Uh, most of the Balkan countries were drawn into the case study of former Yugoslavia and Eastern Europe and the former Eastern Bloc. Turkey was more looked at in relationship to the Middle East and Greece was considered mistakenly, in my opinion, as a properly developed UA EU member state uh, with all the benefits that supposedly that uh, entailed. Nonetheless, in the various exhibitions addressing questions related to the periphery, the global south, from 2000 until 2015, the absence of Greek artists is striking. One of the first things that interests me when I arrived back in Greece was exactly why this occurred and how to reposition contemporary cultural practice from Greece within the discussions of a general global south of post-coloniality and the notion of the periphery itself through an economic reading specifically, because 
the concept of periphery, it's not just the privileges a, a passport can give or a nation state or the belonging to a super state such as the EU, but equally important is the economic status of a country, but also the infrastructures it has or has not for contemporary art. And there are various examples of countries that are geographical peripheries, but nonetheless have solid infrastructure supporting the production and export of their artistic scenes. And I, I do talk uh, about export because I really think that this economic model that is proposed is really copied very well uh, in, in this new art world uh, artwork model that we have. Um, so I was living and studying in the UK and I was working in London for, for seven years until I returned back to, to Greece in 2005. And my view in relationship to the mechanics and the modus operandi of the art world was formed through a perspective of a so-called first world country with a solid economy and the cemented infrastructure for visual arts. And it was abundantly clear for me, therefore, that Greece was the periphery of the art world. No state support for contemporary arts, no arts council, no strategic plan in supporting the production of contemporary artistic practice abroad or within the country. The country was and still is heavily dependent on private funding and private initiative. And there is very scarce produce production of theoretical discourse and very little export of this discourse. And that is of course also because of language barriers and many other reasons. Being an independent curator in Greece at the time of my return, and actually still today, means having to work for free and therefore be able to afford to work for free, which translates to belonging to a certain class, or to have a morning job in order to support one's free curatorial labor. And the idea of precarity, therefore, the second part of, of uh, of the second part of my title in relationship to Greek art workers was a de facto situation way before the financial crisis hit Greece in 2010. And the modus operandi here of any form of para institution of a group exhibition of any initiative was free labor, no artist fees, no exhibition fees, no curatorial fees, no grants, not even a contemporary art museum. Now the contemporary art scene in Greece, uh, for some reason, there we are. Um, the contemporary art scene in Greece, I would say, changed slightly in 2007 with the first edition of the Athens Biennial. Uh, this is one of the main kind of posters, uh, which was extremely prophetic as a title, I would say, because Athens was indeed destroyed almost a year later with the uh, murder of a student that we had and the riots that occurred. Um, but to go back to, uh, to the Athens Biennial, um, the Athens Biennial was the first independent arts organization uh, that really was reflecting on biennial models around the globe that also managed to secure the funds and cultural capital and let's say respectfulness of Deutsche Bank. Uh, which sponsored the first edition of the biennial. And I think for me, that was also something very interesting that you had for the first time, a very important player in global finance that was very much supporting uh, specific uh, endeavors of the, of, of the art world, mainly art fairs uh, that invested uh, in a biennial. Uh, they didn't invest in the following uh, chapters, but um, that you had a, a biennial in Athens that inaugurated itself with a stamp of Deutsche Bank was, was quite interesting. And their task, of course, uh, was to situate Athens as a destination for contemporary uh, art. In parallel, theoretically, uh, the local community was uttering ways of how to formulate itself with texts being produced in an effort to contour this new Greek art scene. That's what, what it was named at the time, mostly um, by artists of my generation. And this dynamic of creating infrastructures that would somehow uphold the development of artistic and curatorial production was cut short with the financial crisis, which I think was a pivotal moment on, on how contemporary art developed in Greece. And I would say that uh, although the financial crisis was felt globally in 2008 in Greece, it 
really was not felt until 10, 11. Again, in terms of the livelihood of, of artists, specifically artists, um, it, there, there was not a huge difference. There was extreme precarity already before, as I said. But um, this, uh, let's say, push that was created by the Athens Biennial only lasted for, for these two first editions because by 2010, after the second edition ended, um, we began uh, to get very heavily into the financial crisis. So somehow it was either that half of, of people already left back to uh, other places uh, or centers, uh, city centers of, of, of Europe, like Berlin or London, or some like myself decided to stay. But we returned to a very, um, uh, let's say safe and very, we knew it very well, this DIY economy model of free labor, self-exploitation, freelance work, that was even more scarce um, after 2010 without having the capacity to structurally uh, build on initiatives such as uh, the Athens Biennial and continue towards institutional models that would somehow construct um, also theoretical narratives that discuss the geopolitical uh, location and situation of Athens. And for me, it was important to somehow give this overview so that you can get a sense as well of how I understand the ideas of periphery and precarity looking at them from the position of Greece and how the social, political and economic parameters uh, defined periphery and precarity were being manifested when that was created and how they have been informing the way we live and breathe as, as a space. So the idea of the institution was in my mind already since 2010 and it formulated through a nomad space, which was very common at the time. There were a lot of, of these kind of pop-up spaces and small spaces. Um, I, was, I, I titled it then very unimaginatively, I have to say, Art Hub Athens. And by 2012, uh, possibly the worst year of the financial crisis, State of Concept was registered um, as an NGO. And in December 2013, um, we opened our doors and have been operating uh, since at the same space. And the location for me uh, was quite important because I felt that there was a need to secure for the long term um, a, a reference point in the city um, as a topos, as a locus, let's say, where audiences would return. And I'm saying that because um, there were a lot of, of things happening in Athens, but because of the precarity, because of the lack of infrastructure, it was, there were many interesting formats of para institutions in that sense that um, were not rented spaces with um, uh, tax registration, etc. So it's interesting to look at it because it's it's a I would say it's a global phenomenon in the sense of power institutions that don't have uh, uh, they are not a legal entity they they somehow operate um, you know as a war machine outside of the state somehow so um, when asking questions uh, in relationship to institutional building uh, that really defines state of concept and the way I understand curatorial work from the institutional position, I, I always take from, from colleagues the uh, have, what, how and for whom, a uh, curatorial collective from, from Zagreb, from Croatia and friends uh, who are now running Kustale Vien. And I'm adding to these three uh, words, the where. Uh, curating or building an institution I knew, I think would always and should always be informed by these four questions. And the where for me was even more important than the other three questions that I would say developed with the institution, specifically the, the how and for whom we have been dealing that later on in, in our um, trajectory. Um, so I, the where basically made me somehow survey the, the local art ecology uh, that, as, as I mentioned, already had uh, interesting examples of artist run spaces or curator run spaces that were mostly operating during warmer summer months, derelict buildings. It could be kind of semi squat situations as well, or, you know, your uncle's apartment that he didn't need it for three months, etc. Um, so 
the name of the institution itself also reflected this asking of these four questions, where, what, how, and for whom. And the circumstances during that moment between 2011 and 2013 of Greece at large, but also the art scene were possibly the hardest. However, they became the most interesting for us and played an extremely important role in how we would be building our program. And as you see here with this, uh, lovely cartoon that I have here for almost half an hour now. Um, it was the period of the pigs, because Greece together with, uh, with uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy and Spain uh, were called pigs and uh, specifically Greece was threatened with, uh, with a Grexit. So Greeks were very keen to think of themselves as belonging to this Christian club of Northern Europe but suddenly realized that their desire to identify with the West was conflicting with the reality of having half a foot at the, on the East. Uh, questions pertaining to how peripheries, financial crisis, uh, exploitation, extraction, and power imbalances relate also to colonial past, racism, and discrimination within also the dynamics of the EU itself became also quite important for us after um, these years. So in relationship to the idea of uh, the first part of my of my talk and this idea of curating as institution as instituting, looking at the where for me, it was important to situate state of concepts as an institution that understands its peripheral and precarious profile, but also uses it instead of wanting to mimic the Northern European centers of cultural production, that it would look and follow examples from art scenes that have similar ecologies. And I was very much inspired by the work of colleague Sara Rifki and the art space that she co-founded with Jens Mayerotze named Beirut uh, that opened its doors in Cairo. It was in Cairo city, but it was named Beirut in 2012. Uh, and I was very much struck by the proposal of uh, Sara and Jens of considering institution building as a curatorial act. And uh, I have here the, the homepage of the institution. Uh, it's still on actually, and it's ex an extremely interesting example to follow of how uh, an institution was built um, in a city like Cairo, which was just at the beginning or rather end uh, of, uh, of a revolution that lasted only for three years exactly because of the political um, situation there. But it made sense for me that with the lack of infrastructural state support, the political turmoil and the economic collapse, as well as the distance from structured institutional models of an art center that is more professionalized and also more neoliberalized, all shared, of course, between Athens and Cairo and several other places, of course, apart from, from these two cities, also came the advantage and the freedom to formulate a program that can really unfold and reflect on a specific curatorial narrative, be critical on institutional models of, of the so-called West, and propose ways of working otherwise, as Maria says, Klamayova, within frameworks that discuss questions relating to socioeconomic and political conditions of such peripheries. So State of Concept had to somehow navigate in its first years these very difficult times, not only times that were not only financial, uh, a financial crisis, but I would say also an existential crisis of, of an identity of what is this people and where they're going. And for us, a curatorial narrative could only um, exist under the umbrella of a reckoning, let's say, with these questions. I mean, some of you or many of you or all of you will probably remember all these uh, beautiful covers of German magazines, you know, literally, I don't even want to say the word because we're being recorded beep on Greece, <laughs> which made the whole population really um, come to face the fact that although Greece was considered the mother of Western civilization, somehow it was really not belonging to this, this club of, of uh, you know, white uh, superiority. Thankfully, if you ask me, but I think for, for the general population that was extremely happy that Greece was part of the EU early on, it was quite a shock. 
So through our first exhibitions, uh, we try to actually reflect on the discussion in relationship to the causes of uh, the financial crisis that identified um, at the time, I would say, by a spike uh, in the debt of Greece after the Olympic Games that it hosted in 2004. But also the newly formed uh, refugee crisis that was further showing the divisions between EU countries and the new nationalisms that we see today in full bloom. And one important example um, was uh, Bass in Magdis exhibition. It was our first international exhibition actually in 2014. Uh, this is a still from, from a film of Bassem called The Dent that was produced in 2014, where he uses footage from, let's say, the centers of the world, Paris, New York, Venice, Basel, Brussels, and all other locations creating a visual collage that follows a narrative of a specific imaginary city that might well be Athens itself. So his film described the story of a city that craved for international fame and applied to host games, some games, Olympic games, so that it can become a tourist destination. And the people of the city decided to start constructing new buildings and spaces and stadiums and all these things, they keep failing then trying again until they finally accept their fate and their failure. Um, so it was an exhibition, it was the first international exhibition we had and it really resonated uh, with people because at the moment, um, because of this confusion as well that existed in, in the country, uh, we were trying to kind of find the root of the problem and we all thought, oh yeah, it must be the Olympic Games, that's why we're broke now. Um, there's no other explanation. We just didn't want to face that there were so many other things happening. Um, one other interesting exhibition, well, event rather that we did um, was also in the summer of 2015. Again, just to show you how the program very much shifted also to according to what was happening. We hosted the Tanya Burgueras Yo Tambien Ejijo, which is basically a, a re-performance or a restaging rather of, of Tatlin's Whisper, uh, which is uh, a piece that she did um, in Cuba in uh, the main central uh, um, square of Havana, where the famous square where Fidel Castro gave his uh, first speech after the revolution, um, where uh, people were invited to actually um, um, have one minute uh, to be on a stage and talk about freedom of speech, which, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in Cuba as well is a highly emotive issue. And at the time, Tanya was actually detained in Cuba. And there were a lot of institutions that were hosting uh, the, these, uh, let's say, recreations of her performative piece um, as an act of solidarity to the artist. But for us, it became really a personal affair because it was just a week before the referendum. Uh, and the amount of um, frustration and the level of division that occurred in Greek society was such that um, we had people taking the stage and then taking the stage again and then taking the stage again to actually be able to discuss things because they couldn't discuss them at home or because they were not talking anymore to their families etc we had it was it was quite an intense i would say um event that by chance it so happened that it occurred just before this um quite painful uh incident in in recent greek history so through that, uh, we realized, through these first exhibitions, we realized that there were questions that we wanted to ask that needed more time to, to unfold. And very quickly, um, the concept of, of the exhibition chapter arrived that we would uh, think uh, and formulate uh, subjects and then try to unfold these subjects through uh, various exhibitions that we hosted. And the first uh, chapter that we did was called the European condition. Uh, of course, again, addressing these first questions, trying to kind of tackle with these questions in relationship to where Greece is in relationship to the European Union, what the European Union is, how the European Union is, seems to be collapsing, 
and the financial crisis uh, that followed it, uh, but also of the refugee crisis that was beginning in 2014, I would say, 13, 14, um, and with a peak that it had in 15, 16. And this is an exhibition of a French artist, Laure Pouvot. Uh, it is on purpose, um, uh, how do you say, spelled wrong, because it's something that Laure does in general. It's called Celeste, not West. Uh, and this is a series of paintings that we commissioned to Laure, where she was uh, cutting uh, front pages from newspapers that were referring to the refugee crisis in Greece. And she made a series of paintings for us, which um, it was not something that she, she was known to do uh, until uh, then. And uh, there was another uh, piece that we showed uh, of hers, which basically began the discussion between the artist and myself called How to Make Money Religiously, where basically describes, um, I would say, uh, it's, it's very much, um, yeah, again, it, it is a very much a film that could have been made for, for the then condition of Greece in relationship to, to the financial crisis. As another. Uh, image from the exhibition. And then another example um, that for us was quite important and actually was the first time that an exhibition became a reality or the title of an exhibition became a reality. Uh, this was the show of Jonas Stahl, uh, a Dutch artist that was, addressing, uh, that was addressing questions that relate to forms of collectivizing and unionizing, looking at the European Union um, as a form that um, is somehow disintegrating. The exhibition was titled After Europe uh, and was centering on the then political, economic and humanitarian crisis in Europe, rejecting both the existing managerial and corporate policies of the EU, as well as the rise of ultranationalist parties all over the continent, uh, where the artist proposed art as a space to criticize and rethink the idea of the political union. And this is a, a series of flags where he's kind of retranslating the, the European flag. Um, the exhibition opened two days after Brexit and uh, the, the audience's reactions were very interesting because they were passing outside of the gallery and they were like, is this something about the Brexit? Are you doing, are you doing some events about Brexit? <laughs> like, no, it just happened so. Um, I would say that a shift that occurred for us was also the announcement uh, of Documenta arriving in Athens and having all this um, trajectory the last years in relationship to, to the European North, um, the power imbalances between the North and the South of the EU were made even more evident. And the art ecology of the city, um, I mean, had since of course, opened up, changed. We had an array of uh, international uh, art spaces opening uh, between 2015 and 2017 that don't exist anymore, but were arriving in Athens to kind of see how the, the scene would be developing. We were following all this, but for us, um, it was important to focus on exactly the questions that were also posing, I think, through Fain Art and through uh, many of our uh, research. Uh, what is the future of, of small scale institutions? Um, I had invited back then uh, Antonia Lampi to actually curate an exhibition for State of Concept. Uh, and she had come for research in Athens. And the feedback that she was receiving was that no matter whether a mega exhibition like in the size of, of Documenta arrives in Greece, actually the infrastructural changes that one would have hoped have not happened. And therefore, uh, that's how Future Climates, which uh, Angela kindly mentioned in her, in her uh, introduction, uh, was created. And we thought of um, uh, how interesting or non-interesting it would be to actually um, um, perform a research platform in that sense through that period of, of Documenta in Athens instead of having just another exhibition uh, when there was saturation of exhibitions happening everywhere in the city. 
So Future Climates was really conceived, I would say, as a dialogue between me and Antonia across uh, different ideas on context, methodology and practices, uh, investigating specifically the economic conditions that determine and define the work of small scale uh, organizations, independent organizations. And it basically revolved around one central question, how can we transform the increasingly precarious uh, existence of these types of organizations and independent art workers as well into a more sustainable one, uh, both in terms of economy, but also work ethics, which tend to not exist when you have such precarious contexts. And in the three month program that we presented, we presented it as the school of redistribution was it, it was its first chapter. We hosted exhibitions, we had uh, 12 researchers that arrived from all over the world looking into the small scale institutions of the city. And we also commissioned um, artist Alexandra Pirici for uh, a new performance entitled Parthenon Marbles. And here you see the image actually on the Parthenon. And I know that this is recorded, but I will say that this was illegal, what we did, because we did not obtain um, access and uh, permission from the Ministry of Culture. It would, this is the Greek bureaucracy. And again, how does an institution in Greece work? Sometimes you have to <laughs> pretend that you're a tourist in order to do a performance uh, on the rock of the Acropolis. Uh, because it would have taken at least two years if we ever got permission to, to do this. So the piece basically tells the story, which is a known story of repatriation. And I think Alexander was one of the, of the first artists to really tap on that in relationship as well to the power imbalances and the financial imbalances that we see uh, uh, when we are discussing uh, looting of artifacts, uh, you know, the, the legacies of the modern museum and the concept of repatriation. So she, uh, she researched this whole controversy around the, the request of repatriation of, of the Parthenon marbles by the Acropolis Museum in Athens from the British Museum in London. But she's using it as a metaphor and an entry point into a larger discussion about capital accumulation, circulation, distribution and redistribution and the role of arts within uh, today's economies. So the work proposes a performative repatriation in a way, which is being done as well on the Acropolis uh, rock just in front of where uh, part of the of the freeze uh, is missing. Um, uh, including a research uh, that uh, is uh, performed by the speakers uh, that she co-authored, uh, co-wrote with Victoria Ivanova, a curator and, and writer. So it's a what if scenario of, of return, but also um, trying to highlight the economic uh, implications that uh, this looted piece has because of all the uh, you know, fake um, artifacts that are being reproduced and sold in the museum shop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the tickets that are being made, and so on. Um, this was the first time that we kind of tapped on these questions that that relate to um, also how this ancient past of ours that is part of of our identity somehow is seen from the outside and how it is seen from the inside and specifically how it affects questions that relate to nationalism and the rise of nationalism that we were witnessing slowly uh, in Greece, which we kind of developed further on. Um, and I will go to another chapter that for us was very important. It was called Department of Justice. Um, it was really delving into artistic practices and curatorial practices that um, discuss and investigate the scope of the judicial, but also research real events. We had some other exhibitions that really researched trials, for instance, uh, or court cases or political trials that have really impacted um, local communities or changed the course of local histories. But also we were looking at histories, uh, specific histories, and how they might have been erased from official narratives of the state, which is very much a case uh, when it comes to Greece. 
Now, this is a, um, a, a new performance that we commissioned uh, to Sanya Ivekovic, a, a Croatian seminal feminist artist. This was a very personal exhibition for me because me and Sanya together, we shared this history. Her mother was a partisan, an anti-Nazi partisan. My grandfather was as well. So we were trying to look at this period to really see uh, uh, two countries that belong into this uh, geographical location uh, and see this through the specter of feminism and how feminisms have developed from that time onwards, which you have two countries, former Yugoslavia and Greece, having extremely different trajectories. One country is having a civil war in 1945 that is basically created by the British in order to stop uh, the development. Well, is Angela is smiling. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, as the Guardian said it, the dirty, the Brit Britain's dirty little secret that is not as known as the Spanish Civil War, but it's, um, it's for us, it's an extremely important event that we, we want to kind of bring forward. And the reason is because in 2015, this division that occurred during 1945 really resurfaced exactly as it was. It kind of came back from the, from the past to, to, to our uh, present. So this performance basically happened um, after we did a lot of research with Sanya, with uh, working with a local archive called ASCII, uh, looking at testimonies and stories from uh, women partisan fighters of that time. And um, uh, Sanya actually used a specific film as well of a documentary filmmaker that, that doesn't live anymore, Alinda Dimitriou, who had interviews from many uh, women guerrilla partisans. And um, she created a new performance with 15 new performers. You will see them, are, they are the ones that are wearing black and red um, uh, in the circle, in the inner circle. Many of whom uh, were actually descendants of women that were in the mountains and were fighting uh, the Nazis. And she has erased all possible, um, all possible, um, references and dates and places and really created a manifesto, you could say, of a future feminism. Uh, it, it could be um, the story or the um, description uh, of a group of women of any age, of any time, of any place, which for me was an, it was an extremely potent uh, and important piece, specifically given the fact that already um, with the, let's say, augmentation of the financial crisis, um, we had seen a lot of anti-feminist and anti-leftist rhetorics augmenting in the country. And because of this division that was created, um, it, was, it was important for us to actually tap on that specific uh, historical moment, looking at it through a feminist perspective, of course. Um, and, Following on that, uh, another uh, exhibition of that uh, chapter was the exhibition with forensic architecture that came, um, I mean, the discussions that we were having with forensic architecture, of course, were revolving mainly around the refugee question and all the work that they have been doing uh, in the Mediterranean through their department forensic oceanography. Um, but for us, uh, also specific uh, investigations that they have done for two very important cases in Greece. One was a murder of our anti-fascist rapper in Greece in September 2013. And the other one, uh, the murder of an LGBTQI activist uh, in September 2018. Um, nonetheless, uh, after many discussions with forensic ar architecture and after the change of government in July 2019, where we saw an extreme um, increase in police violence from July onwards, we wanted to focus uh, on the concept of violence, and specifically state violence, something that forensic have been working on for, for quite some time. And by accident, we were both, well, both, they are 15 people. I was reading um, Rob Nixon and some of the members told me, oh, you know, this is quite an important book for us uh, uh, through our work. So we wanted to kind of analyze uh, Rob Nixon's slow violence, uh, environmentalism of the poor, but also look at this kind of binary of slow and fast violence, violence that is 
normalize because of state violence and really apply that to Greece without referring to the specific investigations that they've done in Greece because they were already quite known. Uh, so the exhibition mainly focuses on, uh, on the region of, uh, of the Gaza Strip in Palestine uh, and the state violence of Israel, but also on the Mediterranean um, Sea uh, and not Greece again, uh, actually Italy, um, uh, between Italy and Libya. Um, and there was a very active public program as well in that exhibition, specifically focusing, the public program was focused only on, on questions of uh, state and police violence in Greece, uh, where we, we had some of the members also analyze the cases that I mentioned uh, later. And uh, to finish off to today and actually go a little bit also to the future, because I think the future is, is somehow more important. Um, I mean, I think the questions that we asked with Forensic and with Alexandra's work somehow re-emerge now with, uh, with our current exhibition, which is um, uh, Kadaratia's exhibition, the Museum of Repair. Um, again, here, the majority of the works are looking into, um, I would say there are two, um, two main questions. On one hand, you have the migrant body of the formerly uh, colonized and the cases that uh, the Kader uh, presents. Of course, in the case of Greece, uh, we don't have former colonies, therefore we don't have um, uh, arrivals from former colonies, and then the extracted artifacts in the heart of the Imperium. So you have these two uh, somehow uh, rejected bodies uh, or also um, 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 revered bodies as well and exoticized bodies from, uh, from, from the Western white gaze arriving back uh, to the heart of the Imperium. And for us, this is very interesting because we're looking at it from a different perspective. One perspective is, of course, of having ourselves also this question of, of repatriation in relationship to cultural artifacts, but also to ha having these new um, forms of racism in Greece due to the refugee crisis from 2010 and onwards. So we're aiming to somehow uh, address these specific questions, but also connect the work of Kader and specifically his focus on the idea of repair and collective trauma with our new uh, second uh, research platform, uh, which is the Bureau of Care. And um, from here, I think I want to somehow focus a little bit on, on more kind of the idea of instituting in relationship to care, because um, the reason we wanted to do this, um, this research platform, I think was, uh, or uh, the reason we thought about it was COVID. Uh, and um, the array of institutions that were very eager to start discussing uh, the concept of care. And the ease at which many institutions were talking about care when they have been so extremely careless for decades. So um, for us, uh, the question was, if we are to discuss about care, uh, the art institution in general is very happy and is very eager to appropriate theory when it comes to care and present the work of Silvia Federici or, you know, whoever have you um, uh, and, you know, make a nice program and a public program, but um, is a little bit less willing to actually engage with those that have been producing knowledge on care and care work and care labor for a long time period for decades now, which have been uh, brought to the attention of all of us because of COVID. So we have decided to start um, closed conversations uh, and workshops with uh, care workers from several different fields and to see how these knowledges that we consider them extremely valuable can and possibly um, um, can first of all possibly be uh, applied also to uh, the format of the art institution, um, but can, can also provide uh, interesting critique to the institution. Um, so the main, um, the main, let's say, uh, axon of the Bureau of Care is to uh, learn, for a lack of a better word, from those that have been providing care work for decades and to see 
if it's possible to actually create a lexicon uh, for the art institution itself to, to have what I name a more careful practice. Um, and I think for us, it's urgent to do this now because we feel that the future of the art institution and specifically art institutions that um, uh, have the guts or have a backbone to actually discuss specific things is very grim. And I'm not, I'm not very hopeful, I have to say, because I feel that we are, uh, we are in a, let's say an intersection at this very moment of things going either way, um, especially because of the COVID pandemic. And um, it somehow felt that the art world was forced to stop for a moment, but then um, pretended business as usual with an extreme array of online content that has uh, somehow made all of us, I mean, we are here, so of course also talking uh, through, through an online platform, but I felt that um, it, many art institutions were very unwilling to reformulate and redistribute their funds in order not to lay out, let's say, staff, um, uh, but also extremely willing to continue their programming um, in order to have some form of presence, specifically those that were pressured to show numbers, visitor numbers or what have you. Um, but smaller scale institutions um, that are already and have been already in very precarious conditions will be facing very difficult questions, I think, the coming years. One, of course, uh, I think there will be uh, the question of a financial crisis that will be arriving because of COVID, uh, but also um, the question of content uh, and whether um, because of COVID and because, of course, also uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement that has become a global movement, institutions being forced to be woke and therefore they are eager to address questions that maybe they were not eager to address beforehand. But how do they do that? Is that a careful practice or is that a careless practice uh, to do it fast and then get it over with? But also um, more general questions that pertain to social justice. Will they be willing to, to answer uh, these questions? Will they be willing to address these questions or because of fear uh, of uh, lack of funds, of um, new, uh, let's say, conservative governments, uh, we would be turning towards a direction where institutions go to more kind of safe pastures. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm going to stop here <laughs> because then I'm going to go more, become more grim even. <laughs> Um, but yes, I think we are in a, in a strange position at the moment and we should be very careful of where we're going to be going. I'm going to stop sharing if I can do it. Yeah. Angela, you, you are muted. I thought I had unmuted myself and I was speaking over you, but no, I, did, I hadn't. So, um, so I'll thank you again then, because obviously you didn't hear that. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation, which is, it, it can be quite um, rather nostalgia. It kind of evokes <laughs> feelings of, you know, hurtfulness in someone yeah. like me, since um, I know the history um, you are narrating and I think that uh, my first comment, also I would like to um, encourage people, you know, if you have questions or comments to just type them in the chat. If you want to um, just talk, you can also, um, I, I can't see the little hand somewhere, but there is, there's a raised hand that you can um, click on and then hopefully I'll see it somehow, but I don't. Mm. Anyway. Are they raised hands on, on Zoom? I don't even know, but I'm... No, no. So I'm... I think it's best that... Um, okay, by clicking reactions, I'm informed. Um, so you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions, which I can certainly see. Uh, or else you can just um, type... Um, just type your, your question. So I can hopefully um, see it. 
But um, Ileana, um, the, the first thing I want to point out in relation to tonight's uh, material that you presented is that in your discussion of um, peripheries or I don't know, same peripheries if we take Greece as um, yeah, as a semi one, yeah. It doesn't if, matter. If, for, for me, this is, these are very relative uh, terms. Um, so my, my point is that, okay, if we take Greece as a case study, but I think this would be um, applicable elsewhere as well. It seems that curating as instituting does not just entail the question of precarity, but also the question of precariousness. That there are a lot of which is a different thing. There are kind of like positions that are extremely fragile and uncertain. Uh, narratives that are hidden. I will take the, the work that um, you, you did with uh, Sanya Ivekovic. Um, uh, the, the narratives that you addressed, which are extremely rare, you know. I mean, it's very rare that we have um, institutions, art institutions, Art institutions that are actually perceived to work with international artists, you know, to come up, we have to say this, that are uh, willing to kind of um, embed curatorial research or research curating in relation to this hidden history, such as the partisans, the, the women partisans, uh, the civil war um, that marked, you know, the continent, certainly the Balkans and of course Spain and so on. So. I think it's uh, also because of the situation a lot of states, not just peripheries, uh, have been facing this end of uh, liberalism, as we understand it traditionally. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling that, I mean, today there was um, an article in The Guardian that I was reading about actually the UK and the end of liberalism, you know, as uh, this notion of like liberal democracy, um, the new authoritarianism, that which is for how many years this is going to be called new i don't know but what i'm saying is there is a real risk here as to i mean my fear for the future is to what extent art institutions so-called independent art institutions be allowed to be the happy hour for such narratives and so far in, um, I would say, museology perhaps, and maybe in relation to curatorial studies, we have been asking the question, are museums um, places of power? But now we don't need to ask this about museums because we have been asking it for many years. For now, we can ask, you know, uh, is any art institution, <laughs> no matter how small, a kind of uh, place of power if, it can bring to the fore for the public or a counter public even this kind of uh, hidden sides of history. So I know um, this was a very long winded. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long one, but it's a, it's a really good one. I mean, it, you said you said you answered uh, in, in fact what I wanted to say in, in relationship to the idea of the counter. Uh, because it produces counter publics and it can be a counter hegemony if we look at it through a Gramscian uh, point of view that is that is only what what an art institution can be I mean it is a conundrum of course because the art world at large and uh, art at large is a bourgeois product and is unfortunately embedded in this whole uh, neoliberal construction but um, my fear personally is Yes, indeed. My fear is will art institutions that choose to address and uh, discuss subject matters that uh, pertain to politics, to difficult histories, to, 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 will they be allowed to do so? Uh, and you phrased it very well. Will, will they even be allowed to be the happy hour? Because, of course, art, artistic practice or curatorial practice or any form of, of, of artistic um, of cultural presentation does not have direct power to it's not an active agent most of the times but it can be an active agent i think for me for instance forensic architecture is an example of a practice they don't call themselves artists but they present their work in art institutions and museums and biennials etc that has really 
uh, proven that has is an active agent of power and can actually produce change. There has been change specifically in, in the case, the investigation that they did with the murder of 44 students in Mexico, for instance, there was uh, a change of government, there was, uh, there was a, a very big potential that happened through, uh, uh, you know, uh, an investigation that was done by a research agency slash artist mm -hmm. from a different place. But in general, no, we don't have power. We don't have power for direct change, but we have the power to ignite the sparks of uh, active citizenship uh, in, in, in the brain of, of, of an audience in order to somehow uh, you know, prepare the ground for, for active change, may, maybe. Maybe I'm too romantic, but I, no, I think- No, no, um, sorry, sorry to cut you, because I'm seeing people raise hands, which maybe you don't, but I do. Oh, no, I don't. I'm, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, how to change the world without taking power. That was the title of a book, as we know. Um, I don't believe in it. But I love the book. Anyway, I'm going to take, um, we can come back to this. I'm going to take Gabor uh, Ulix um, um, and ask you to unmute Gabor so you can ask you, your question. Where? I lost you now. Yes, I am unmuted. There you are. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Pleasure. I am. Uh, part of, of the Finite Network as a researcher, and my research deals with the uh, center and periphery or core and periphery or semi-periphery to a large extent. I'm a native of Hungary, so uh, this is basically the main reason why I'm also interested in, in this issue. And the question I would like to raise is, uh, is a twofold question on, on the first hand. I, I was reading your, your paper when, when you coined this term, uh, narcissistic authoritarian statism, which is, uh, let's say, under which um, Hungarians have been living for, unfortunately, 11 years now. Oh, but uh, in my opinion, this, um, the, the phenomenon, uh, NES, is, has the potential to change a little bit uh, this um, discussion about center and periphery, because you can actually imagine or experience narcissistic authoritarian statism. Uh, in the center as well as in the peripheries. So the question and the first hand is, do you have or have you thought of any, any method in which you can embody this uh, um, as a curator to address uh, the, the changes the mm -hmm. narcissistic authoritarian statism brings up to the art field in general? And on the other hand, uh, when uh, you were speaking about the the periphery and adding this very important w to the whw so where as as an important factor uh for any kind of artistic organizing or curatorial practice i personally just because i don't really know many examples i missed a little bit of of the work of of greek artists with which i'm not trying to nationalize this problem of the periphery or shared struggle <laughs> Uh, I just personally would, would like to know a little bit more whether there's a local artist uh, joining your, mm, your platform for this kind of establishing a certain new knowledge or a structure of, of knowledges that can work together in order to like dismantle the NAS. And thank you again for your presentation. Thank you so much for two excellent questions. Um, I, and thank you for reading my very long essay, double essay on narcissistic authoritarian statism. Um, I am actually using uh, a, a very incredible, really incredible and undervalued uh, theorist from the 70s, uh, Poulan Zas, who has written on authoritarian statism. And he, he wrote his book, in the late 70s, right when Greece, Portugal and Spain were actually coming out of dictatorships. And he is really focusing on, uh, let's say deprivations uh, that elected governments uh, begin to do, uh, that for him uh, are really uh, signs of a very particular type of authoritarian statism. And he, of course, is looking at that through a very specific time frame when globalization is just beginning to kind of really cement itself as something that is here to stay. 
Um, and for me, I would say uh, that I kind of added the narcissistic to that because um, I'm seeing uh, exactly what he was seeing, but I'm also seeing the technological and the technocratic and the very turbo capitalist aspect of the state today that is not just a state, but it's a state corporation. There is always the corporation that is hand in hand with the state. So you see a different model. And I think also technology um, augments this narcissism that we see because all these leaders that are very happy to shake hands with, uh, uh, I don't know, the CEO of Apple or whomever and bring them in to uh, you know, have a new factory without paying any taxes, I'm just making it that, this up just to, to make an example, are also very happy to manipulate populations through social media, through WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, what have you. And I think Orban uh, has been one of those that have used that very successfully together with Bolsonaro, together with, um, uh, of course, Trump, that is, let's say, the epitome of this narcissistic authoritarian state. You made a very interesting question in terms of how can these peripheries that have these types of, uh, of let's say, figures of power, that they only are there because they really represent a system, a whole system of power that kind of supports them. They're only the straw men in most of the cases. How can they shift this, this paradigm and, be, and the periphery somehow becomes a center? Um, it's a really interesting question. I think that they don't and they can't. And the reason they don't and they can't is because they cannot amass the amount of capital that is needed uh, in order to be a center. They remain peripheries, but the play, I mean, I think one of the main successful mechanisms of their strategy and why they are widely accepted, or let's say not widely accepted, but accepted as enough in order to have majority and, and win elections, is because they play exactly on that. They play on the, uh, and please forgive me, I'm saying it from the position of, of having it our, ourselves in Greece, this inferiority complex of wanting to be more Western, wanting to be more white, wanting to be more powerful, wanting to be more center, and therefore having this kind of almost psychotic moment where you want to reject that completely and then you have these new nationalisms that arise and it's a, an illusion of power an illusion that you're becoming a center of your own somehow but you are not really you are not uh, i mean i think that uh, i'm more uh, afraid of the of the supra states and the uh, trans state formations like the IMF and many other organizations that can actually show you very quickly how much of no power you have when they want to, rather, uh, uh, and how much influence they have also in these types of elections that we don't know and we don't see, uh, rather than um, uh, the kind of micro uh, shifts of power that occur uh, because of Orban. Again, I'm not saying, of course, that cases like Bolsonaro or Orban are not cases to be taken very, very seriously. They should. And the reason they should is because they can create rifts in the way that decisions are made in the centers of power. And we've seen that specifically in the European Union with, with his example. And also Brazil is another very good example because it's countries that have some type of leverage and they can play types of, of games. To kind of uh, look at that through um, the position uh, or, or through the cultural field, I mean, uh, I think that um, it's very difficult. For us, it's not as difficult yet uh, because if there is no infrastructure, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Poland system, for instance. I don't know whether you have state funding, whether you have institutions that are extremely dependent to the state, whether they are small state, state or uh, non independent organizations that get municipal or state funding, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, when you have these uh, types of governance that's very much reminiscent dictatorship times, I think that it becomes extremely difficult to be able to have the flexibility to pose questions through your program um, 
that really address these types uh, of, of power. And we've seen it also with Warsaw, I think, and I'm not, I, I'm not at all equipped to talk about it, but I'm sure that Kuba in his next lecture will also address it. And I'm sure that you, as a poll, you know probably lots of examples. Uh, Angela wanted to say something. Yes, Please interrupt I'm going me. to, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you because uh, we have more questions. <laughs> okay. Yes, so I'm, 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 I am I have here. To be rude. Here. This is this is this. No, don't worry. I don't know if you want to close. Um, just, yeah, just, but... just to for the second question that I didn't answer, um, I I on purpose omitted all the Greek artists that we have had in our program, uh, which are always we have a solo exhibition of a Greek artist every year. It's one solo of a Greek artist, two solos of international, and one group exhibition. Normally, now with COVID and everything, this has changed, and the reason is because of the comment that Angela made, that I want to, to show that for me, it's not just creating a bridge because, be, between Athens and the international art scene. Okay, yeah, you we're bringing all these great names. My point is to actually engage the practices of international artists with the geopolitical locality of Greece and the thematics that they can uh, draw from, from, uh, from our work. So, I mean, a Greek one would naturally more do that more easily or maybe not, but it doesn't matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gabor, for your question. Uh, Karen is next. Uh, Iliana, before you answer anybody else, uh, I'm going to ask. Very fast. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. No worries. Uh, so, uh, Karen, you can. Uh, you are unmuted, so you can just talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you again. I try to be short as well. Um, it was very impressive how you guided us through the whole history of the exhibitions and also through the conceptual background of uh, the idea of um, curating as instituting. I really like the idea of it. Um, I have a very basic question because uh, you didn't talk so much for whom um, and I'm really interested in that but not only in for whom, but also in with whom. Uh, so how did you build, yeah, how did you build the team to institute? Um, uh, how, how did that work? Thank you. Well, yes, the, the, the for whom, I think it's a, it's, it's a little bit, um, yes, as I said, this question, the for whom, uh, the, the how and the for whom it uh, somehow became whilst we were developing as an institution. Now with whom, um, I can only say it's always with women somehow. It's a team that was always a, an all-female team. Um, with, uh, a, we are a very small team uh, because of precarity and precariousness, as Angela very correctly said. Um, so we are a team of three people, um, which, I mean, now I have uh, new uh, colleagues since a year and a half, um, and uh, we, we hope to grow and be more, and then we have a lot of external collaborations. We have worked with um, curators um, from, uh, from the local art scene um, that also can use the space in order to present their work, for instance, Elkita like Karabai is one example. Um, uh, so we operate also as a host, not only um, as a pro content producer. Um, yeah, so the for whom, uh, and also with a lot of, um, I, this is, is a large part of the program that I didn't talk because I we would never end, uh, which is also with communities and individuals and journalists and researchers and uh, activists that come from uh, Athens and are very close to the subject matters that we talk about. Um, that work with us, but uh, in the institutions, only three people. Okay, I, I just want to repeat the name, if um, Elpida Caraba that you mentioned before, yes, yes. that is... Um... And Pat, uh, Pat is yes, a, a tempor temporary was... art academy, which is a collective uh, who's actually going to be curating the, group, the next group exhibition that we're having mm -hmm. after the COVID nightmare ends. So, so... Yeah, Elpida is like a member of that and she's been doing very um, uh, radical and super engaging work in, in art history, in contemporary art history in various ways. Um, the next question comes from Noah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, you have to wait. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I was very much looking forward uh, to listen to it. Um, I would like to pick up from a term that you used, mechanisms, um, and in relation to precarity. And this is to ask, um, what do you think are the mechanisms um, in operation that maintain this state of precarity um, of independent art spaces and, and artists? In your in 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 the very context of, of your work of of of, uh, of Greece in specific, I mean it's not it just it doesn't pertain only to Greece. I, I think the uh, just to give the example, when we had the second chapter of Future Climates in Paris, uh, it was a whole day symposium and discussion with fifteen organizations from Paris. And me and Antonia were thinking, well, you know, what's the what problem do they have? They're in Paris, man. Come on, it's like a first world country. It came to, we came to kind of bite our tongues and realize that the problems that a lot of small scale organizations face in Paris are exactly the same ones that we face, which is um, mainly lack uh, of access to, to funds. Um, and not because there are fun, there are no funds, obviously, uh, in, you know, in, a, in an economy like France, there are more funds, but the access is more difficult. Um, so for me, one of the main mechanisms uh, in order to sustain precarity, even if you're an individual worker that is in a factory or whether it is in the art world or wherever, is to create a distance between uh, capital and the person that uh, is uh, in need of that capital in order to somehow put them in a position where they would accept conditions of work um, with less pay. Uh, and I think one of the main problems, and I'll try to be very fast, Angela, uh, one of the main problems of neoliberalism that really um, kind of seeped into the art world, and art, the art world is the perfect guinea pig for, for neoliberalism, because with the whole pretense of freelance work and being your own boss in the art world, or, and the, pres the whole presentation of specifically curatorial work as, oh, this is so glamorous and cosmopolitan, this idea of cosmopolitanism where you take a plane and you arrive and you go to places, etc., and you can calculate when you want to work and not work, um, is presented as something exceptionally fantastic and, and beautiful, but it's actually producing uh, subjectivities that are overworked um, and that are basing their uh, their development through cultural capital and visibility rather than actual capital and sustainability. So this is one, one very big problem for me, which is how curatorial work is seen uh, and how it, it's so commodified itself as, as a product, as a, as a status, uh, which actually is, is, a, is, is a work that uh, has a very short time span and has no health insurance, has, you know, lacks a lot of, um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm interrupting rudely again, uh, because, because we have very little time left and I'm going to, we have a written question, which is likely the last one to take before that. I'm going to uh, give the floor to Alexei Penzin, who's, who's been having his hand raised for a while now. Hello, Alexei, good to see you. Um. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Do you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just uh, was uh, provoked by this discussion of urgent political matters, uh, uh, provoked by this, this uh, question by Gabor, I think, about those uh, narcissistic narcissistic figures of these kind of new authoritarian leaders, etc. But uh, in the end, I want to connect this to this sort of institutional question. So uh, I was, I felt even, um, how to say, insulted that the name of um, Vladimir Putin was not mentioned because, uh, uh, because He's too um, obvious, I, I, that's I, I, why. I, I, <laughs> yes, and you, you probably know, uh, because it's from my corner of, uh, and you probably know more because uh, as far as I understand, uh, my comrades from Stodel is collective there, you've been doing uh, yes, exhibitions yes. with them like in September. Yes, so so yes, we have yes. a lot of these debates about how, what are the perspectives of what happens with this new mode of kind of authoritarian capitalism, you can call it like this, somehow what are the effects on institutional 
aspects of art, etc. And I can tell you that in this sense, this Russia is kind of pioneering as in, uh, in the sense of the wars uh, of developments in some kind of, kind of setting up the model for this. So I can tell you, for example, that just recently, because the question of culture and institutions is very important to establish this sort of hegemony in kind of Gramscian terms and to somehow to intervene. And, and this started already uh, a few years ago because before they didn't care about culture, but now they are really more and more and more involved in this producing new restrictions. For example, now to have a public event, I think you need to have a license. To, this should be somehow certified and they're, they're just using this sort of kind of flexible, not just repressing, but rather using flexible bureaucratic mechanisms to uh, limit the public sphere, free discussion and critical discussion, etc. So that, that's, that's interesting. That's uh, interesting to hear. I'm sorry to yeah. both. Um, yeah. I hope I'll say that this wasn't a comment because there is no time to for No, my question was my, ah, uh, this was a, a comment plus <laughs> yeah plus question because okay. it was actually not the, um, how to say critical but in the sense that I was asking this question so a few years ago uh, as well on, on these debates uh, uh, between art uh, kind of people who are related to institution theorists it's politics etc because uh, my pro my question is <laughs> rather big so i'm not expecting a, a kind of response uh, but uh, given this new situation uh, uh, all these uh, old mechanisms old in the sense that they were uh, quite present in previous decade uh, uh, these notions of precarity this notion of micropolitics, instituting, et cetera, how they relate to these macro things, which are just as ugly as huge they are. I mean, Trump, uh, all these things, because uh, Erdogan, Putin, et cetera. So, because uh, it seems to me, it's like a, a building a kind of Lego game on the table while the whole house is a kind of- Is on fire. Burning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's, so that's, is, a, that's a good question, but I mean, you know, um, a, a lot of people ask me this question and I always say, I, we, we talk about it with Angela a lot as well. I mean, we can do as much activist work that we want or uh, active citizenship, you know, as in go to the street, complain, sign a, a, mm -hmm. a petition, uh, what have you, all forms of, uh, of really, uh, let's say, uh, rejecting uh, politicians and politics and policies of these uh, of these figures and that does not necessarily have to be part and parcel of your artistic practice or your curatorial practice or your professional practice it can be a separate entity of your life that you're extremely activist and also again the, the art institution it's as much as they can do it, the art institution cannot uh, overthrow a government uh, you know, if that happens, that would be fantastic. But I'm, I'm, you know, I don't put so much weight on the art institution. If the art institution can operate and it's not shut down because of um, uh, censorship or what have you, if it can operate and if it has the power and and the desire and the guts to actually pose questions that will make people think, for me, that is enough. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy. Mm -hmm. um, I would have a lot to say about this, but I won't because uh, we're done with time. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to use my last minute here to read out a question that perhaps we can all take with us, although it is addressed to Iliana uh, from uh, Ali um, Aladawi. Uh, thank you so much for the interesting presentation. I want to ask you about your opinion on the decolonization discourse common in art institutions and centers that in a way fueled on the expanding precarity on peripheries. How curating goes in critical dialogue process to this between center periphery? Um, Ali, you've sent a very complicated uh, situation. Probably would have to start with what decolonizing implies because there would be several interpretations of it. Um, there's a big project now called Decolonizing it's Greece, Hellas, yes, which I'm also taking part, which is very interesting, you know. Um, I think um, our host is telling me that we're, we're, we're done with time. Very sorry about this, but I'm delighted to say that the discussion was, um, was very vibrant. And I want to thank everyone for, Iliana, above all, for the presentation, uh, for the questions. We always need more time. 
Um, and I don't suffer from online fatigue. I'm delighted that we can actually have more and more discussions without having to take airplanes. Um, even in that, I will agree. At least let's not just for the environment, but also for the tiredness that comes with that. And I see nothing wrong. I'm happy to be seeing you, you know, on the screen and everybody else. So because there's other things that we still haven't lost in that regard. So true. Um, so thank you to Fine Art for uh, for the lecture um, and to everyone involved in in the technical aspects of it and in the conceptualization and so on. And don't forget, uh, we'd love to see you in a month's time for Cuba's Redus talk, the May Fine Art uh, talk. Again, Ileana, thank you. And, thank um, you. Thank have you very much. A nice evening and uh, week and uh, happy Orthodox history because this is also <laughs> happening in some parts of, uh, of the world. Of the world, yes. <laughs> okay. Bank holiday. Okay. It's definitely a bank holiday. Bye, Not everyone. Me, but, <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.